Would you mind closing the door, honey? Yeah, thanks. Okay, um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, it's strange, difficult times, so I don't really know what's going on with the login. Uh, never been an issue before, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with our teleconferences and Zoom calls this past week, it's been a challenge to get in. So maybe it's the volume, um, not a time, but I'm glad that um, the 32 that are in the room got in. Um, we have 97 signed up, so uh, it's about a third, which is kind of scary, but we are uh, recording this webinar, so it will be available if people even can't log on. So. Um, for you that don't know, my name is Patrick Lowen. I am with the Chiefs of Ontario. I'm the Senior Special Education Support Technician there. Very long title, but um, I've been in that position for, for four years now, and I love working with everybody in their First Nation communities. Um, first of all, I think uh, on the behalf of Chiefs of Ontario, we hope that you and your families and schools are, and communities are safe and are doing as well as possible. Um, we also know that it's, it's, a, it's a real challenging time for our students uh, and teachers. Um, many communities are on lockdown and will be on lockdown, uh, which presents, you know, obviously challenges. And I also think for uh, moving to this uh, home learning environment, um, whatever you want to call it, is, is going to be challenging. And we have to recognize that for our students and be uh, very um, patient with them and their parents and families, right? Um, at Chiefs Ontario right now, we're in constant contact with the Ministry of Education and uh, Indigenous Service Canada advocating for First Nation students and special needs learners, because that's even a, another layer of challenges learning from home if you are used to having an EA or, or uh, uh, speech and language or whatever it might be. So. Um, it, it really, really is something that, you know, we're going to do our best, but it's not going to be perfect, right? But uh, together, you know, we, we, can, we can do this. Uh, during the webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in in the chat or the Q&A uh, functioning. And myself and, and Lori will keep an eye on that and answer the questions the best we can, um, either during the presentation or um, after the presentation. But you know, I know Laura, she's really engaging. So the more questions, the better, I think. Um, and then, you know, to present our wonderful presenter, Lori. Um, Lori is from OEC. Um, she's been a strong ally for us at Chiefs of Ontario and helped us for a couple of years now, you know, building capacity and sharing her knowledge and expertise um, when it comes to education. And we're really grateful for that. Lori never turns down my requests, which is awesome. Um, so Lori, she's a, she's a creator, lead teacher and trainer and researcher of exception and functioning based teaching movement called Active Learning. Uh, she's been teaching um, for over 17 years in, in special education and typical classrooms uh, and remains a teacher at heart. Um, she's currently a, a fourth year st uh, a doctoral student at OIC, which is University of Toronto. Uh, and she's working at the, the Learning Engagement and Attention Lab. So please join me in, in, in welcoming uh, Lori. And uh, Lori, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you everyone uh, who's here, who managed to get in, and also to everyone who couldn't get in and is now sort of watching on the, the recorded version. Uh, it's always such a treat. Um, to present with y'all. I wish that I could see you and hear you. I miss that part of this and I hope that you'll give me uh, whatever feedback you can in the chat function uh, in terms of we don't understand this or that really resonates. Um, whatever equivalent you can make to a, no a nod of the head and a smile or a confused look would be really, really helpful. Um, and so I want to talk to you today about something that um, I'm quite preoccupied right by right now. I'm uh, involved in writing a few papers about this, and it's a bit of an emerging theory. And so I'm really interested in sort of uh, what you think about it. It's grounded in a lot of science. And so my goal is going to be to kind of amuse you and entertain you and engage you in something uh, that's 
that's got a lot of meat to it, but that's also sort of um, uh, creative and um, uh, that you can participate in a little bit. So thank you. Um, and so we're going to talk about how um, self-regulated learning and diversity kind of work together. Um, and my curiosity about this topic uh, mirrors, so I'm just now figuring out, oh, here we go, okay. So what I'm interested in really is this idea of A to B in school. So how do we get students to do self-regulated learning? How do we get them to respond to our challenges and sort of mobilize all of their strategies and cognitions and abilities and experiences and get themselves to the end point? Uh, and that's sort of self-regulated learning. We like to call it independence. We think of certain students in our room. I bet everyone right now can call to mind a student that is a very good self-regulated learner. You ask them to do something and they just hop to it. And similarly, I bet you can think of a student who basically needs you by their side the whole time. Um, and so this is learning regulation. Sometimes students are self-regulated and sometimes they need teachers to help them regulate. Um, Self-regulated learning is a really old idea. It's, I mean, sort of researchers have been talking about it for a hundred years. And we've been learning about how it supports the very best uh, and most successful learners. And that in general, students will uh, plan what type of goal they're gonna pursue. Uh, they then, uh, do some strategies or take some action. And after that, they sort of reflect on how it worked and maybe we'll, we'll uh, make different plans the next time. That's sort of self-regulated learning. And I, I would imagine that you all do some self-regulated learning in your life. Uh, as you're troubleshooting and learning how to use new technology, as you're meeting new people, uh, you're learning new ideas. Another important thing to know is that self-regulated learning um, develops in children um, according to sort of four stages. And so they begin just sort of being able to observe it and, and watch it and recognize it. Um, so they may watch us do some self-regulated learning. Then they may begin to emulate our self-regulated learning approaches and styles. Then they begin to exert a little bit of self-control and then they finally become sort of fully self-regulated where they can transfer all those skills to different um, settings and they are really very self-regulated in, in, in an independent way. And I also imagine that as you think about your students, you could probably slot all of the students that you work with into these four levels because in any one class, we may have five students who are actually self-regulated if we're lucky. Um, many who are just sort of operating according to emulation and lots that are just sort of sitting back but that are, are really unable to do much self-regulated learning on their own. I want to zip you back actually through my slides here and I want to show you a picture of these two guys. So uh, this is, these are um, Dr. Greens and Shunk and they are the authors of a very big volume of essays on self-regulated learning that just came out in 2018. So they edited this massive book. It's the state of the art of self-regulated learning. And at the very beginning, they pose this big enduring question that no one can solve, which is why the heck can't we get this going in schools? <laughs> so these two guys, um, you know, my, my scholarly colleagues, so many of us are trying to figure out why is this so hard to do? Why is it so hard? Um, for teachers and students and teachers and students working in teams to do the things that are needed to, to move students more successfully towards these self-regulated learning goals. It's really hard to get it going in schools. And that's what I kind of want to talk a little bit about today. I want to talk about all of the problems that we have um, doing this, why it's so tricky. And I hope as I'm describing this, you're gonna feel a sense sort of, not of being defeated, but maybe a little bit of catharsis. So I would like you to feel a sense of, yes, that's what it is. That's why it's so hard. Um, because my intent really is to validate the fact that this is a Herculean task, a very difficult thing for anyone to do, and that probably the world's leading experts, Dr. Green and Dr. Shunk, were they to enter one of our classrooms and spend a good week or two there, they would experience the exact same types of problems that we're having on the front line. 
Uh, so I want to talk all about the challenges and then I want to end off just giving one quick, easy little solution uh, that's kind of fun. Um, so you've heard a little bit about me. You've sort of heard a little bit about what self-regulated learning is. Um, and now I want to think about, I want to just sort of stop that line of discussion for a minute and um, just tell you one little delightful thing about me. Because what's so nice when we come together in community is to think about what makes us really different and textured and that really um, builds up this uh, group expertise among us. And so I want to tell you something delightful about myself, and that is that um, I'm a little bit of a survivalist and that I have um, a little bit of land in the country, a little bit, and I have a little um, off-grid place there, and I basically do all the work on that place myself. And so I read manuals and I try to learn about um, how, little, how my solar system works, and um, I have an outhouse, and I fancy myself to be a real survivalist. So that's, part, that's sort of a delightful and weird and wonderful thing about me. And I wonder um, if you could all get on the chat just now and think about something that is really unique and sort of weird and wonderful that represents your special passions and interests and what's so weird and wonderful about you. So I'm gonna give you a minute to do that. <laughs> No pressure. And it can be something really sort of random and something really um, super unique just to you, something that people might not know about you, but what is a special passion and interest? Five foot two, is that what you said? Five foot 20? Oh, Patrick, that's awesome. <laughs> So five foot 20, I usually uh, say that so people have to do a little bit of mental math. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And six, eight. <laughs> yeah, six, eight. Amazing. There we go. People are. I love teaching home decor and creating my home. Reality show junkie. Don't forget what it's like to be a kid. Grow milkweed and raise monarch population. Wow. Oh, that's wonderful. Learning my language, writing and music. Singing and songwriting. Oh. Hi, Carol. Nibisa. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing, everybody. That's awesome. Yeah, it's so wonderful. I'll just leave another minute or two in case anybody else wants to throw. I love to read and write science fiction. And I track nerds and geeks and we love each other. <laughs> That's so That's cool. Awesome. Switch it to all panelists and attendees so we can see everyone's answers. Oh. You can see them, okay. It is on that setting. Card making and sending, sending happy mail to friends and family, especially right now. Wow. I love the outdoors. I like being to myself, so I don't mind this isolation. After my work hours, hours it's outside I go. That's from Fox. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, you'll see as we go forward that these personal, unique things about each of us, wow, fermenting foods, really contributes to your ability to self-regulate and also for, to children's ability to self-regulate their learning. That their pathway around that plan, do, and reflect is really dictated by what they care about, by their cognitive skills, by their passions, all of those things. Attendees have to switch their settings, so I see. Okay, um, and so, I mean, as you're trying to get self-regulated learning going in your classrooms, you're, you're pulling out all the stops, you're giving really clear instructions and uh, specifying your goals and putting everything in the zone of proximal development so that the children have a good chance of being able to succeed. Um, you may notice different types of engagement in your students. This for me, when I discovered this was very, very cathartic and interesting. So in the literature, 
it says that you, the ch your children in your class may either demonstrate really focused engagement. So these are the students, you know, doing the optimal performance, very positive in, uh, behaviors. They're doing exactly what you ask them to do, and they seem to have all the skills and the abilities that they need in order to do this. You may see some doing sort of task management. So they're sort of preparing to engage in the task. They're getting themselves ready. They're locating materials and asking questions. And then probably um, maybe the most noticeable group of students will be those doing competing behaviors. So those students who are not meeting classroom expectations and they may be doing other things to sort of distract from the, the fact that they're not able to meet these expectations. Um, they may be not complying, they may be di actively disrupting, or they may be avoiding. These are our students who are falling off their chairs and telling jokes and heading into the hall for their third trip to the washroom. We know they do this um, as, a, as actually an adaptive behavior and as a way to protect their ego and protect their social status amongst their friends. But these are some of the things that you might see. And so I wonder, as you're trying to, uh, you know, and still student self-regulated learning, how is it going? Would you pick a word from the first word cloud or the second word cloud? Um, could you please into the chat function, type a word that describes how it's going as you're trying to instill self-regulated learning in your students? You can pick one of these words or you can pick a, create a word of your own, um, but how would you describe your luck? Aha. Headache and patience, underwhelming, yeah, does require a lot of patience. And I, re I resonate with that headache because I, um, coming home uh, uh, from a day of teaching, I often really needed to unwind. Sometimes for my first couple of years, it was straight into the bathtub, actually, just to try to whew, decompress. Struggling, frustrating. So I'm not seeing a lot from the second word cloud, which is really really sort of uh, what I expected. Interesting and eye-opening, those are fascinating. If you wouldn't mind Liz and Tanya um, writing a teeny bit more about that, my goodness, that would be interesting. Transforming, overwhelming, disheartening. This is great. I wish, I wish that Zoom had a function where we could gen quickly generate our own word cloud. Right. A little button, a little word cloud button. Life changing. <laughs> wow. You see, this is where I'd like to be in a room with you because I would really like to follow up on some of these words. But anyhow, this is really, really so interesting. Like nailing jello to the wall, says Carol. Just when I think I've found a great strategy, things change. Have to be constantly reactive to individual student needs and live curricula. Yeah, so true. I was just reading a thing that talks about all the qualities uh, that we need as teachers to instill self-regulated learning and it's all sorts of adaptability and um, self-reflection and problem solving, never sticking with the, with your first idea and hopeful. Thank you, everybody. That gives a good flavor to the conversation. Empowering, it's wonderful. And it's true, I mean, if you can, to whatever extent you can be successful as a teacher of self-regulated learning, you are giving so much power um, to students who um, can begin to learn how to use all of their talents, sort of everything, you know, they were given, all of their passions and interests and, and cognitive ability and skill and um, all of their history, all of their background, everything that makes them unique. Students should, in theory, be able to apply that towards their problem solving. So thanks, everyone. Uh, what we know is that um, when students do these sort of unexpected behaviors, um, it's pretty irresistible uh, for teachers not to sort of respond. And so that when we see children um, in our classrooms, we may see this, some doing self-regulated learning, we may see some getting ready and getting organized, and then some head off to the washroom or um, rock back in their chair or avoid the task, that it is very tempting for us to very quickly initiate sort of a teacher 
regulation of learning. And it's almost like they've lured us like a, those fancy baits you buy in the bait store, a, a fancy lure. And we strike on it with our teacher regulated learning. If we're not in really careful control of ourselves, we strike at it and they tempt us with so many different sort of luring behaviors. You know, this might be the student that's making little tapping noises on his desk with his pencil. And this might be the student who's been to the washroom three times. Uh, you know, this is the temptation for us from the student uh, who is making, doing some kind of a little scratching noise, um, et cetera. We know that we are very, very tempted to quickly intervene when we see students uh, not doing self-regulated learning. Lori? Uh, yes. I think we have a couple of good observations and questions here from Liz and Chelsea. Do you want to look into that? Yeah, please? for sure. So Liz says, I work as an EA. I often am wondering what kids are actually going through in their minds. I find it interesting to see how, where their minds work. Sometimes it's not exactly what the teacher wants, but what the student understands in their own mind. Does this make sense? Yes. Liz, actually, that really is kind of where this whole um, discussion is building towards. Um, that we what we want to do actually is more of sort of a socially supported regulation of learning where we actively check in with students learn more about exactly kind of what they're struggling with what they might be able to bring to the problem and and just support them in their process of doing the self-regulated learning support them in identifying the challenges determining solutions and taking appropriate action so i couldn't agree more um, but that can be very hard to do, which is really the, the crux of my work is that it is very hard to support self-regulated learning of potentially 25 to 30 individuals all the time. And this is sort of where teachers are starting to burn out. And so my suggestion, um, which I'll share a little couple of slides down the road, is um, something that forms that into a protocol and makes it a little bit more achievable. Interpretation is a huge factor, says Chelsea. Um, did I miss anything, Patrick? Any of the any of the questions, or do you think that I? Oh, I think that's good. Okay, cool. Um, and so here's here's something we know about what stress a stressful classroom, maybe an overwhelming classroom with students doing a lot of competing behaviors. Here's how it can lead us straight towards a really heavily sort of teacher driven regulation of learning. So where we take ourselves away from uh, a, a stance of empowering children to do their own learning regulation and we sort of take it over. And so when, when all this stuff is going on, we know that teachers often and very reasonably increase structure right away. So when the class seems to be out of control, we increase structure and we may give very specific instructions to students and who can blame us. Um, that we often take more responsibility for their outcomes. And so we may kind of wade in and give them a hand through the first few steps. Uh, it becomes much harder just to stand back and let them go through the process or even to stand back and encourage them through the steps of a self-regulated learning process. And we know that we make our goals, we make the work a little bit smaller and our expectations a little bit smaller and a little bit more achievable. All these things are perfectly valid and reasonable um, and, and actually sort of very generous moves from a teacher, not to mention they're pretty exhausting, time consuming. Um, this is really, really hard work. This is the work of a teacher is to adapt and respond in all of these ways. Um, so how could we blame teachers for, t for having this reaction? In fact, though, when you look at it from a different perspective, it, it may cause an interruption to children's ability to do self-regulated learning. It probably does. So where in a classroom of students, you may have sort of students with a big capacity to do self-regulated learning, some doing just sort of baby self-regulated learning, maybe just at the observational stage. Maybe some of them are really excellent self-regulated learners. Maybe for some it's barely even perceptible and maybe some aren't doing any at all. When we get into a stressful situation and we start to take over and we start initiating teacher regulation of learning, 
we move all of those little processes into the into the teacher so the teacher begins to dictate all of the plan do and reflect and we might hear things like we might hear the teacher say something like okay everybody stop listen to my directions so does this sound familiar um, to you i know it during busy uh, overwhelming times in my classroom sometimes i would say i know you're all off doing your own things but this is too much stop everybody listen to my directions we're going to all do it one way because this is getting too crazy or the teacher might do a process of self-regulation self-regulated learning themselves and you might hear a teacher say start your essay like this i know you were doing it in your own ways but it's not working right now just everybody we're going to use this beginning sentence or take some advice from me or you may say this to one individual student here's an idea start your essay like this put your ideas into this list we might say we might say okay everybody to find all of the grammar mistakes, read your writing into a voice recorder. If we've got one of the, if we've got iPads or a, some kind of fancy recording device, we may process for ourselves. This is what's hard about this task. This is what we should do. Here's what you all need to do. So in this way, we're sort of directing the learning regulation according to our own preferences, our own learning styles, our own cognitions. Um, our own interpretation and monitoring of what the problem is all about. I think there's one more quote on here. We may say, oh, everybody go and write in a silent space, when in fact, some of the students might think best when they're talking through their ideas. It may only be in our sort of, <laughs> in our minds, in our experience, according to our cognitions and skills, that writing silently is the most appropriate but we tend to just sort of take over, take more responsibility, give clearer directions when we're sort of overwhelmed. Or we might tell them exactly how to organize their writing and their papers. And again, who can blame us because we're being responsible, professional people, we're making the room safe, um, we're sort of taking responsibility for their outcomes. Um, because I think we all know, um, you know we have a huge really with great power comes great responsibility we have a huge responsibility to these children they're not going to learn to read and write um, they're not going to graduate school and high school unless we um, ensure that they get there unless we ensure that they meet expectations and so th this can be what happens um, and and it's a lot of work and teachers often say, oh my goodness, I feel like I'm wearing out the treads on my shoes. You're either supporting their self-regulated learning one-on-one -on -one, or you're processing so much on your own and trying to come up with so many unique strategies um, all, all yourself. And so this takes a lot of, this is definitely not the path of least resistance. The problem is what happens next and so from my experience in the classroom, my many years, you know, you can be giving your all to a student. You can be sleeves rolled up, kneeling next to their desk. I've made time for you, kid. Let's talk about what's hard for you. And they will be, if you're over here, the student is sort of like, oh, slouching away from you, trying to move away. Um, doesn't seem to want the help. And I actually, I remember saying on multiple occasions to students, I've made time for you. I'm here for you. Are you here for me? The sheer number of times that I had to say that sort of made me um, suspicious. Like something's going wrong here. Somehow I'm not meeting their needs, even though I'm giving them all this help. And here's what we know that when teachers wade in and do a lot of regulating sort of for students, we know that we fail their needs for autonomy, so being able to make choices and do things their own way. Competence, feeling like they have the skills and abilities required and that their ideas are good and they know how to start the darn essay themselves. Um, and relatedness, that they're known to us, that they're free agents, that they're individuals um, that we see as separate from ourselves and that we recognize them as um, sort of capable and um, unique. And so we fail those, those three key needs for motivation, um, which is just so frustrating because we're working so hard to do this teacher regulation. 
We also know that a sense of control, so being able to do things their own way, um, is really calming and regulating for a lot of students. We know that we sort of fail them, fail both of those key needs, despite the fact that we're working our tushies off all day long doing a ton of sort of really heavy duty teaching work. For me, this is an exciting thing to recognize because there's a reason. There's a reason for their reaction. There's like a very well-established psychological um, problem going on. And once we know, once we are aware that that problem is happening, then we're even closer to solving it. Um, the other thing that I think about sometimes is, well, you know, teacher regulated learning, you know, if we're kind of sharing our strategies with them and modeling how we would do things and telling them, just trust me, you know, um, you know, start your essay this way, just observe and emulate the way I'm doing it. Maybe isn't that part of self-regulated learning? The problem is, um, because it is part of sort of what we know about how self-regulated learning comes online. The problem is that when we do teacher regulated learning, um, I'm just going to skip forward one, one more slide, that even the, even the observational phase of teacher regulated learning or of self-regulated learning is supposed to include sort of the teacher, the teacher not modeling exactly what the, the, the end strategy would be, but the teacher modeling goal setting. So it's not the teacher modeling, here's what I would do. It's the teacher modeling, here's what I'm thinking. Here's how I'm planning, doing, and reflecting. It's them observing the process of self-regulated learning, not the outcome of self-regulated learning. So when we're just giving them the strategies that work for us and giving them really specific instructions, we're actually still not meeting their need to just do that basic obs observation because what they need to be observing is us in the process of self-regulated learning. They need to know more about what we're doing. And so something that we know that they need to learn as they're observing, they need to see us doing metacognition, thinking about our thinking. That's very, very important. And that they need something called informed training. So they need to be explicitly told what we're doing. So when we do that teacher regulated learning and we start sort of doing all those, um, you know, taking lots of responsibility for what they're learning, giving them specific strategies, um, we're failing to do these really important um, pieces that they need in order to become self-regulated learning. Um, the other important thing to think about is, and I mentioned it earlier, is that this whole process of self-regulated learning really has a lot to do with each individual student. It has to do with personal qualities. So their ability to do this process has to do with their, their IQ, their executive functions, their ability to plan, organize, manage their emotions, um, whether or not they know their math facts, for example. So all kinds of personal factors, how they feel that day. Um, a lot of behavioral factors as well, how they tend to behave in school, sort of what their, um, what strategies they tend to use, uh, how they um, sort of tend to relate to their peers and the people around them, how their relationships are with their teachers. And it also has to do with their specific context, which is really important. It has to do with how much support they're getting at home, how they feel in school, how they felt last year in school, what their sense of where they're going uh, if they have a, a clear sense of where they're going with their education, that all those big contextual factors matter as well. And so when we drive learning regulation according to our personal behavioral and, and contextual uh, reality, we're really missing out on the fact that they are different. Their self-regulated learning will proceed completely differently to ours for the most part. Um, 
And so some of the things that I just talked about, these are some of the personal, behavioral, and contextual factors. Um, and so I assume, uh, you know, as all of you are sort of sitting in whatever context you're in, all scattered all across sort of Northern Ontario, you're regulating your learning right now. You're regulating your learning according to all these factors. All of these factors might be contributing just a little bit to how well you're able to sort of manage, achieve what you want to achieve from this lunch and learn and sort of be successful, whatever that means to you. Um, and so we sort of talked about your special skills and passions. I wonder in general if um, sort of organizationally or in terms of your attention, anybody has certain strategies that they're using, really specific strategies that you're using to maintain your attention and, and stay focused and meet your objectives. Would you just take a minute and type those into the chat feature? What are you specifically doing, you as an individual? How are you regulating your learning right now? Yeah. And that's so interesting, Julie, because you're taking notes, but I wonder, are you taking them for any reason other than your own learning regulation? I mean, are those notes due to anyone or are you, is it really just to support your ability to pay attention? What is everyone else doing? I have snacks. Yep, that helps. Me too. My snacks. I know Patrick had a couple of snacks. Take a comfortable place in my home and I'm sitting in the front window facing my backyard. Yeah, that's nice. Everybody sort of brings their own, I tend to be an auditory learner, so I'm using headphones to make it easy to help me ignore auditory, auditory distractions. That's so great. And I wonder if I was doing a sort of a teacher regulation of learning on you, let's say everything got crazy. <laughs> all of you, let's say all of you were visible and none of you were muted and everything seemed so overwhelming and stressful to me. I might have said, I might have said to all of you, uh, you know, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put on headphones and I want you to take notes. And I wonder how comfortable it would have been um, you know, for Chelsea, who would much rather sit in front of the window and keep her spirits high by looking at the backyard. Ah, cooking lunch, taking care of children while I listen to this at home. Wonderful. But maybe by, maybe me knowing that I can, um, you know, if this was sort of a longer term engagement and I knew that you had to learn through multitasking as your teacher, I might then be able to incorporate some of your work with your children into my lessons or mention it. Just knowing more about your diversity is so useful for me. I would really like to learn from this. She's a teacher and this is a big concern for her. And I'm thinking about how I can get this to her after. Oh, don't, don't worry about problem solving that, Lee. We are gonna, we're recording it. You could just send her the link. Actually folding laundry, being physically active and listening is helping me process. And, Hey, that, that's a great thing. And one of the wonderful things about these video conferences actually, you know, when we try to, I think some classrooms sometimes have those bouncing balls or even like little running tracks that kids can be on, but it gets noisy, but wow, you have infinite possibilities to use your own personal strategies in this context. <laughs> so it's really nice just to be able to fully validate you as really diverse and delightful. Um, individuals each of you is bringing a whole set of really special qualities to this and in fact we know that for different learning tasks all of these personal behavior and contextual factors are going to mix and they're going to be used in different ways and maybe for certain um, tasks if you suffer with um, oppositional and defiant disorder certain tasks are going to trigger you more and less and that's going to look different if you have problems with attention different tasks are going to trigger you more or less your history might be more of an asset in different um, self-regulation self-regulated learning opportunities and what we know is that as you go through your day all of these personal factors it's almost kaleidoscopic the way it shifts and changes so I might know all about you as a learner in one context, 
and then we might switch into science or math or phys ed or group work and the, the kaleidoscope twists again and all of a sudden you're bringing a whole different pattern of skills and abilities, personal behavior and contextual factors to your learning regulation. Patrick? Yes, I have a question here from Dawn. She's wondering where sensory issues would fit on the chart. She's, ah, she's, cool. she's suggesting personal, but. Yeah, I think so. And you know how these things work. They're never really cut and dried. So, I mean, the sensory issues might um, uh, kick off some behavioral responses. Sensory issues might mean you, you have different learning behaviors that you bring to your learning. So it's an interesting question. I had the same thought and I put, I think I put history into two different places, culture, language, and history into personal and contextual. And they may even relate to behavioral actually when I think about it. So it's really, um, these things are almost like cloud patterns and they shift and change or like a kaleidoscope. Um, and my point really is that those things are at the heart of learning and we really don't know a whole lot about our students. And even if we do know a whole lot about them, we probably won't know a whole lot about all of those factors five minutes later or in a different subject or at a different time of day or after something weird has happened at home. Um, or we may wander into a subject where they have no background knowledge. And so it's really, really hard for us to function as teacher regulators of learning because we just don't have a good enough command of all of those factors that are at the heart of this self-regulated learning that are we're trying to foster in children and so they're really sort of hidden in there we don't know and so we know just to sort of recap self-regulated learning is pretty challenging to implement we know uh, teachers tell us all over the place that it seems to take constant individual attention. They can never quite keep up with the children uh, while they're working with a group over here. Another group over here has sort of lost the plot and they would need to have sometimes I um, at, in per, at an in person presentation, I might say you get this one going and then you get that one going and then you feel like you need to have stick your foot out the back and keep this group going and it's like you need to have 10 different hands help everybody and it can be quite challenging but we also know um, that uh, teacher regulated learning is an, can be inherently though entirely valid and understandable and a heck of a lot of work and quite valiant in many ways can be really inherently unmotivating for students when they're on the receiving end of it and that it really doesn't support the self-regulated learning the growth of self-regulated learning that we're hoping for and so I want to just open your eyes to this third form, which is in the literature called socially shared learning regulation. It has a lot going for it. So this is where instead of trying to work one on one, we gather all the students up together and we go through that process of self regulated learning together as a team. Um, and I'm here's where I'm going to get really, really practical and we're going to actually do this together. This is in the form of a protocol. Protocols are amazing. Um, when you're trying to do something that is not natural to you, where you know it's really easy to slip out of a sort of a self-regulated learning practice and to slip into teacher regulated learning, you know, you're starting to feel frustrated and you're thinking, oh, everybody stop, just listen to my instructions. I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. So when we're at risk of slipping into habits that are the most comfortable and sort of the path of least resistance things we're used to doing, a protocol can be amazing. It's just a little bit of structure that helps us get used to a new, a new thing. And so we're going to use the barriers and strategies protocol. We're going to imagine we're in front of a room full of students that's starting to stress us out because they're not getting their writing done. And we're going to actually do this. We're going to ask as a team, we're all going to talk about what is your barrier to success for this task? And as a team, what strategies can we use to overcome these obstacles? Our answers are going to be so different. We're going to have such a dazzling variety. We're going to learn more about each other as we do it. And we may, uh, learn some strategies that we've never thought of, but we might like to try because they're strategies that our friends suggested. Okay, so now don't panic. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen in a different way because I want to be able to type 
into my desktop. So now you get to see my messy desktop and all my, can you see my slides now, everybody? Patrick, can you see them? Yes, yes, we can. Perfect. Okay, so now we're just trying to be a little bit more fancy. Okay. Yes, 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 everybody's saying. Okay, cool. So strategies to get writing done. I am not going to initiate teacher-regulated learning, even though, boys and girls, I see that you're all sort of goofing around and I see that people aren't getting work done. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a deep breath and I'm going to regulate my own performance as a teacher using a protocol. It's not easy for me. I really want the room to calm down. I'm really overwhelmed and stressed as a teacher, but I'm going to use this little protocol. So... Come to the carpet, boys and girls, and I want you to tell me. Teach me something about yourself. What is hard for you about getting writing done? And here's where I want you to fill up that chat feature and tell me. Think about when you're writing report cards. What is hard for you when you're trying to get writing done? Tell me what stands in your way. I know what stands in my way, but this isn't about my self-regulated learning. This is about yours. I want to empower you. Distraction. Mine goes blank. Totally, keep going. Not know, oh, totally, not knowing what to write about. Where to start? Oh yeah, mine wanders. Perfectionist. Long to-do list, so other things. I'm sorry if I'm missing your ideas. Spelling, so just little skills. Oh, I didn't know it was slowing down your self-regulated learning. How to spell a word. Getting distracted. So great. Don't know what to write. So here's what I'm hoping, boys and girls. I'm hoping as you're listening to all of your classmates that you're feeling a little bit reassured that you're not the only person who has a hard time. You're not the only person that has trouble. That's what I'm hoping. And for me, I'm learning so much. This is database teaching. I'm learning a ton about you as learners. I had no idea you weren't writing because you were stuck on your spelling. And noise, these are so many things that I can help with. Now, I am not going to fall into the trap of right away saying, oh, spelling is a problem. Boys and girls, stop. I'm going to do teacher regulation. I'm going to teach a spelling lesson. I'm going to go one step further, and I'm going to support the growth of your self-regulated learning by also supporting you through uh, planning and what strategies are you going to use? So now I would love for you to really populate that um, The chat feature with what strategies do you use? You have different histories different experiences you had different teachers last year in grade three You all learn different strategies. So tell me what do you do? To solve some of these challenges. What are your great strategies? And I know every room brainstorm. Oh, you start with brainstorming uh, brainstorming, mind mapping. These are all things you might have learned from other teachers. Inquiry-based learning. What do you mean by that as a student? Hmm. That sounds like from a teacher's perspective. I hope you, can we translate that into a student's perspective? Your bugs. What do we do? Model the writing with a read aloud. Let's go from a student's perspective. Imagine your students, what do you do? Drawing first. What do you do as your, or what do you do as you're writing your report cards? Keeping records up. So making sure you have all your um, notes ready to go. Records up to date. It's so true. It's terrible to start trying to write report cards and realize you haven't done all your marking. Give yourself permission to put down thoughts. Ah, put down sort of good enough thoughts. Talk to my students. Good enough thoughts, ideas. Talk it out. You know what? That's great for me as a teacher. I was just about to shut you all down and make you work silently. It's really useful information for me that talking it out helps. Scheduled breaks. I apologize if I've missed a great idea. What have I missed? Pull a topic that mentions they might have said in previous conversations something they've seen or if they want. So something that maybe relate it to things you know about. Okay, and so um, Patrick, I'm now over four minutes over time, but I'm um, sort of selfishly assuming I can go till 1.15 because we started late. That's correct. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. 
Thank goodness. And so let's reflect on this process that we just did. Here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping, um, Carol here has written, set small goals, get five report cards done, and then I can have, and maybe she's thinking, then I can have a break, a walk, I can go outside, I can paint, I can do one of these things that I love. I'm hoping that when Myrna and Chelsea and Corey read what Carol thought of, that there might be some kind of a social dynamic going on there that would mean that Carol was a very influential um, peer, potentially much more influential than a, than a sort of boring old grown up at the front of the room. But we know that the social connections between and amongst um, peer groups among children can be quite powerful. It's also pretty destigmatizing, maybe for us to hear, let me just scan through. Um, oh, I see Fox has written, go with a student, go with what the student is interested in. Okay, that's a little bit more student oriented. Tell myself to just write things down and I'll fix the spelling later. So Carol wrote, this is something she's doing. And maybe for a lot of other students in the room, they might think, oh, I just thought Carol was sort of perfect at everything she tried. But now I know that she sort of writes it down, gives herself permission, and goes back and fixes it later. So that might be really motivating for the students in terms of being willing to try strategies. Um, okay. And so I wonder if there's anything, if anybody has any other observations sort of about this process and, and how it feels. Um, I hope it makes made you feel a little bit validated in terms of your all the things that make you feel motivated. Hope it made you feel competent. Hope it made you feel like me as the teacher, um, really believe, I really believe that you have something cool to offer and that you may have some unique competencies and experiences um, to share. I hope it made you feel a little bit autonomous, free to follow your own path and your own choice and, that, and powerful and like I believe you can be successful. And I hope it made you feel as though you belonged a little bit. I hope it made you feel as though people in the room are having a chance to really know you, your perspective, and where you're coming from. Um, does anyone have any other observations about that barriers and strategies protocol as a, as a way to kind of patch in some self-regulated learning teaching? Just giving a bit, and I'm going to go back into. Okay, and so we know that this kind of semi-structured protocol really helps us slow down, um, resist bias, so resist sort of the way we think the world works, break habits, gather some good data, and intentionally interrupt ourselves. So this is something we need to do if we want to have any sort of power over our sort of knee-jerk, very legitimate response towards teacher-regulated learning, we have to do something a little bit radical. We need to intentionally interrupt. We need to slow down the whole pattern and do something a little bit structured. Um, and so really that's the core uh, uh, that's the core practice that i wanted to share with you this barriers and strategies protocol i would encourage you you know the next time you're in a room full of students which at the rate we're going might be june um but even potentially sort of with your own family with yourself um, this is a really sort of proven goal striving approach um, that gets used with individuals where you can teach yourself to be more self-regulated um, if you actually, when, you, when you're facing a problem, let's say for me, really need to get some exercise every day, really not achieving that goal just yet, to stop and think, what are my barriers? What is really stopping me? And what's the strategy that I can use to address that barrier? So you can start to use this barriers and strategies idea right away. Um, and when you get back into your classroom, you'll see that if you sit down with students and you do this for five or 10 minutes and then say, okay, everyone, amazing. We've got a whole bunch of strategies that you all came up with. Thank you so much for, for contributing. Off you go. I'm going to walk around. And my role now is to really 
appreciate your self-regulation. I really want to see what strategy you're using. I want to see if you discover a new strategy, but my role is to empower your self-regulated learning. That is what I see as my most important job as your teacher. Um, and I am going to do everything I can to stop myself from trying to regulate for you. Take a deep breath, use a protocol to let me pass that power back over to you and regulate according to all of the skills and the abilities and the histories and the competencies that you bring. And then these become great things to talk about in report cards. I mean, you begin to know, oh, you know, certain student, that student is a big list maker. They tackle a lot of different challenges by listing. This student is a big uh, collaborator. They tackle a lot of different challenges by working in teams with other people. And then you can really begin to talk in report cards about how your students do their learning, which for me was always very, very useful. So it's a small strategy. It's been designed and designed and designed again by teams of teachers um, from the Trillium Lakelands District School Board and from all over the place. Um, to be feasible. That's one of the most important things about this strategy is it's a five minute, 10 minute feasible quick thing. And it's an intentional interruption to your teacher regulation of learning. Um, and so just threw in some quotes here at the end that may inspire you a little bit. Um, there's a, a, an Israeli scholar who talks about self-regulated self -regulated learning and that it should evolve towards a more holistic communal, and we're talking about that socially supported uh, framework. So if we're heading into the 21st century where we're going to need cooperation, negotiation, and teamwork, we should be able to, we should be working like that in school. We should be working with students, not competitively, but more collaboratively and socially supporting their self-regulated learning. Here's another idea, is that in a diverse classroom and a multicultural classroom, the sharing of culturally specific thinking approaches um, or thinking approaches that relate to my family or what my mom does for her job or who my teacher was last year or whether or not I know my times tables or all the things that are special about me, that might, if I can hear what everybody brings to the table, I might learn something really important. So learning from Patrick's strategies and Holly's strategies, just as we were regulating the setup of this conference, really expanded my strategic capital, just because I slowed down and did that in a socially supportive way. And open supportive communities of self-regulation may be an antidote to feeling marginalized, um, feeling alone, feeling unknown, feeling um, like you have nothing to offer. Uh, which can cause emotional withdrawal and struggles with mental health, uh, poor performance and maladaptive social behaviors and, and low aspiration. We know we need each other. We need each other in meaningful, substantial and substantive ways. We need to work together on real things. Uh, and so my, my, um, my call, my battle call is that we need to teach children like we're preparing them to to become astronauts like they do at uh, NASA, where they prepare people for completely unknowable challenges, where there's no script, there's no person telling them the way that they should do things. It's all about them. It's all about how they recruit their unique skills, their talents, their passions, interests, histories, all the rest of it, and solve problems that way. Um, so thank you, everybody. I know that many people might have something else to do at 1 o'clock. It's now 1.14, but I would be very, very happy to chat uh, more with anybody who would like to uh, answer questions or Patrick, however I can be most useful. Sure. So we're, we're st we'll stay on for a bit, and then if people need to leave, we respect that. Um, but if you have any questions, please, please put them in the, the chat room there, and we'll, we'll get to them. Um, Okay, great. We're getting some thank yous here. Um, I do have a question myself here, working with a student uh, in the past where success and failure was very black and white, right? So um, when the student was successful at task, it worked well, but as soon as there was one little mistake, and we have the perfectionists in that, it, it really shut down. So could you address that, Lori, and self-regulation and, and, and when it comes to that? Um, well, I mean, I really think one of our, during our berries and strategies conversations, 
one of the participants actually raised that as a big barrier. You know, mm -hmm. I get very stressed about making everything perfect. I think you'll find that a lot of students do, and sometimes they're the students who have a ton to offer. There are students who will turn in a science test with not a single word written on it who know the most about science because they're completely fussed about being perfect. And I think we need to have open conversations about it. I think it's an actual problem. I think it feels really, really hard to them and there's no pat solution that a teacher can give them. I think when they'll start to learn and grow and figure out how to self-regulate beyond that is when they fully explore the problem with their peers, when they see that they're not the only ones, they may see that there's one or two other students in the room who feel the same way. And when they've had a chance to, I mean, if you were recognizing this as a problem in your classroom, you could just tackle it and only it in a conversation and say, what are we going to do about this when we feel really stressed about perfection? I can tell you I had this exact conversation with a student. One of them said, this is so weird. But I, when I'm reading a test and I'm feeling like I want to be a perfectionist, I read it in a, in a genius accent. And she actually did the genius accent and it sounded a bit like Albert Einstein. It was like a bit of a quasi German accent. So she would, she said, sometimes I read the test like this and then it makes me realize it's not so hard. And I said, Oh my goodness. That is so weird. It's so weird. And it's so wonderful. I would never, ever have thought of that. But you, because you know so much about your, your personal behavioral and contextual world you know that that works for you and it's so weird and wonderful and so cool and then three or four other students in the room started using it and it became this crazy thing where i was suggesting that students use a what ended up being really a german accent to read their tests or an einstein accent right. and so really weird and wonderful things can happen uh, and effective things can happen when we let children have more of a role in their self-regulated learning and we empower them. Correct. Uh, you do have a question from Tanya, if you want to read that. Yeah. I'm an EA and my student likes to only write about the same thing every day. How would I be able to change their topic without upsetting them? That's so interesting. Gosh. Um, well, maybe uh, as an EA, I think it's, it's a teeny bit tricky because you miss out on the group dynamic. And so um, what would be, it's not directly answering your question, but it would be really interesting to tackle that problem in a group of peers, maybe by talking to the students. It may be a problem that the students sort of whole class teacher sees and might think it was interesting. And what if you brought this cool new barriers and strategies protocol idea and said, I'd like to try something with the whole class. Here's the thing. My teacher wants me to write on a certain topic and I don't want to write about it. What are the barriers and what are the strategies? You may discover all kinds of things like students might say, um, I only know how to spell, I don't know, I only know how to spell certain words about a certain topic or I can't think of any cool ideas or I feel bored. And you, you will be amazed when you get to the strategies part, how creative and ingenious and supportive students can be. You know, they might say things like, um, See if you can shift it into something you do know a little bit about. Or what if you make yourself a character in that new scenario? Or what if you're allowed to have a conversation with a friend before you start to get your ideas flowing? They come up with all kinds of things that really teaches you, just any individual would never be able to think of when you, when you use social support and self-regulated learning. Yeah, and I think also that, you know, not knowing the student, but some students, that's their comfort zone, right? That's where, where they're, they're comfortable and they lack self-confidence to take a risk to write about something that maybe they don't know enough about okay. in their minds, right? Okay. Uh, so, so just like you mentioned, maybe giving them some time to share, giving, giving them, maybe I'll give them the topic the day before so they can do a little bit okay. of research and thinking about it okay. and it's not just dropped in their lap, not that's saying right. oh, yes, but... Yeah. Uh, I think that also helps uh, and, and could be small little steps that leads to them, you know, eventually taking that risk of, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to write about something. new. That's right. And I think the trick is to put, put the question out to them and hope that you will be well and truly shocked by what they come up with. And if they say, if they say a strategy or a barrier and your first reaction is to go, 
oh, no, that's not what I was thinking of, or, oh, I don't think that'll work, or that's not exactly, that's a clue that they've probably told you something that you didn't already know. That's a little clue that you're, you have the opportunity to do some real learning about your students. And so a great response there is just, oh, oh, tell me more about that. That is so weird. Tell me more about that. It's weird and wonderful. I want to learn about how that works. And if you dig just a little bit deeper, you might be surprised and actually learn something really new about what your learners need, uh, what they're like, you know, what kind of strategies will be appropriate. Right, and Myrna also adds, which is great, is I found that some students have difficulty getting words out, so I transcribe for them and record it for them first. Yes, yes. Yep. Um, yep. I do have a question from Don here. Uh, it says, what would your advice be on dividing the students who are having difficulties with self-regulation? Do the pro protocol checklist and the other groups continue with their work? So kind of divide them or? Uh, well, I mean, here's the thing is that there's no one right practice for every group. It's all about your feel as a teacher. Uh, if you if you suspect that might be interesting, it might be worth trying. Um, in, ter in terms of my frame of reference and my experiences, um, I, I would say that it's really great to mix them all because some of the stronger students have some pretty neat ideas. Some of the stronger students, the, some of the stronger self-regulators might actually reveal barriers that you didn't know that they were experiencing. So a student who always finishes their writing may come out and say something amazing like, actually, I always feel very scared, um, you know, but my mother taught me or my grandmother, my elder taught me this way to feel safer uh, about writing or about sharing or I always relate it to this thing I learned in another context and that's why I'm successful and all of a sudden everyone in the room it's like a mind-blowing moment I had no idea you were doing self-regulation I thought it just came easily for you I mean I have a friend he, I always think of him as sort of my smartest friend and he, he told me once that he remembers things using memory tricks like he actually um, I don't know, uses, like he'll give each thing he's trying to remember a letter of the alphabet or something. And I was so shocked and a little bit inspired because I always assumed that he was just so vastly um, intellectually superior to me that he just did it naturally. And realizing, oh, you're strategic too, was very empowering and, and inspiring to me. Great. Yeah. Okay, any last second questions here? Um, I think we're good. We're still having people ha staying on here, which is awesome. I guess yeah. being at home, <laughs> we have lots of time on. Yeah. Um, but again, I, I apologize for the technical difficulties. I've uh, received a lot of emails from Zoom here, so it, it might actually be on their end. Uh, there's also been some internet issues, but we did record the webinar. We'll send it out. You can share it with your colleagues. Maybe have. Um, uh, you know, some professional learning around it where you pull it up. You guys have heard it. Maybe you can be the teacher and go through it. Uh, so there's lots of opportunities that you can do with this. Um, we'll, we'll send you the link. We'll post it on our website. Uh, we also want to thank Lori again for her expertise, her uh, engaging way of, of always, um, you know, presenting and, and even in a a virtual platform like this we had lots of interaction which is great and I thank the participants for jumping in there and sharing because it makes it much oh, more engaging. So great such a wonderful community and actually if I could just share, share one last thing before Absolutely. you go. So if you're playing around with this idea um, and you want to can you see my screen now Patrick? Yeah. Yeah okay and so um, I, I mentioned that I've worked out a lot of these ideas with teacher communities and this is sort of this activatedlearning.org website is sort of the home for the community of people that play around with um, the barriers and strategies protocol and um, socially supported regulation of learning. And so uh, there's tons of stuff in here. There's a whole gallery showing kind of all the different kinds of things teachers do, obstacles and strategies. So this is a neat place to come. We talk a lot about executive functions too, which is one of those personal qualities that kids use. 
So there's a lot of information on there. And then the other cool place that I post a lot of information is just on a good old fashioned Twitter feed where I'm sort of constantly, um, let's see, oh goodness, I often make that mistake. I wanna see my feed. How do I do that? Here we go. So where I often sort of forward things that really relate to this idea of socially supported regulation of learning, I post a ton of interesting research and try to sift out what's the most important thing. And then I post teachers all the way from kindergarten right up through university who are using barriers and strategies, protocols, and, and how that went with their students and how that feels and looks. So those are two resources that may be useful to you. And now I'm done. <laughs> Good? Yeah. So thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. It was so nice to be with you today. I hope you're doing okay. Keep your chins up. Enjoy Good, thank you, Lori. Sunny day. Yep, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody stay safe. We'll stay in touch. Miigwech. Bye-bye. Miigwech.